Good afternoon. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're starting the afternoon with a talk by Paul Zin Justin on Schubert puzzle as exactly solvable model. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I should also say, oh, yeah, so first, yes, I added at the last minute a map because somebody asked me where Melbourne is. So here, here is Melbourne. And you can see it's at the very southern tip of continental Australia. So now you all know. All right, next. Um, yes, yeah, so this is, uh, most of the talk will be joint, based on joint work with Alan Knutson. The papers are there. Uh, there are three of them. The last one was put on the archive very recently. I'm oh, sorry, I'm out of. Let's try again. Um, and also, there's a Macaulay 2 package which uh, implements all the combinatorial rules uh, that I'm going to present today. Uh, so all these are papers you can find online. Hopefully, one day they will be published. But uh, for now, they're just uh, on the web. And the subject is something you've already heard about quite a bit yesterday. We're going to talk about Schubert polynomials and how to multiply them. So the first part of the talk will be a bit of a repeat of a lot of things from yesterday, but then we'll diverge a little bit and we'll talk about the other part of the title, which is exactly solvable models, which is my own field. We'll explain how methods from uh, mathematical physics can help us uh, solve some of the issues, uh, uh, like how to multiply Schubert polynomials, basically. Um, right. Let's see if I can get this to work. Yes. So we've heard many times about Schubert polynomials. They were introduced by Lascaux and Schitt and Vergé. Uh, to represent homology classes um, in, of Schubert cycles in flag varieties. I'm not going to talk about the geometry today. We've heard already about this yesterday. This will be more of a combinatorial talk. Um, also, I should point out that as an older member of this community, I, I got to interact quite a bit with Alain, and he, he left us 10 years ago, and I still miss his, uh, like probably some other members of the audience, his great uh, advice and his very original um, point of view on everything. So it's, uh, it's good to be able to talk about his work now. Anyway, um, science, yes. So Schubert polynomials, we've seen the definition before, uh, but I will repeat it anyway, just for, it's pretty much the exact same notations and everything that we saw before. So the first thing I do is I, I so S infinity is the um, uh, permutations of uh, positive integers, which stabilize at some point, which are, differ from the identity only in a finite number of spots, and you can think of it as the union of Sn, where Sn is just permutations of the numbers 1n, and then it's just the identity after that. So we've seen uh, this before, and so now I take such a permutation, uh, sigma in S infinity, and I define a polynomial in uh, the variables x1, x2, dot, 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 an infinite, countably uh, infinite number of variables. And I, so th this ring, oh yeah, so these are integer uh, coefficients uh, polynomials, so I call this ring R, and so S sigma is defined inductively by the following formula. Um, so first there's the starting point of the induction, which again, we've already seen. You take the longest permutation in Sn, and, and then the, uh, the corresponding, uh, okay, so I have a pointer. Here we go, so the longest permutation has the simple monomial form, and then any other permutation can be obtained from this one by acting on the right with the elementary transpositions, and so the way you do it is each time you have a um, okay, in, in, each time you have sigma of i less than sigma i plus one, you have an, an ascent in your permutation, you, you can say that s sigma equals di of s sigma si. So, um, and it's not completely obvious that this is a consistent set of rules, uh, because first, because you, uh, you know, oh, and, and di is a divided difference operator we've seen many times. It's the, uh, it's f minus f where you switch xi and xi plus one divided by xi minus xi plus one. Um, but it is a, a consistent definition, and uh, uh, as I said, I'm not going to repeat this. Uh, Anna has discussed this uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, let's go straight to an example. Um, this is the same example, I'm afraid, everybody takes, which is uh, S3. It's kind of the only one that fits on the slide anyway. Um, so S3 to 1 is x1 squared x2. And the way I like to think about it is, you know, you, what you do is you switch the, so this is the one, I was you're going to use a one row notation for permutations. And, um, and the way you should think about it is you just permute the, the, the numbers in the row, one row notation. So for example, you start from three to one, you go to two, three, one, you're switching the first two digits, uh, uh, the first two digits of the one row uh, notation of the permutation, therefore you apply 
D1, the, the, the one that switches X1 and X2. And so you do it here, and you know, if you do X1 squared, X2 minus X2 squared, X1, you divide by X1 minus X2, if, sure enough, you get X1, X2. And similarly, if you switch the last two digits, you, you apply D2, and in this case, you just get X1 squared, and so on. Then you can apply again D2, D1. Of course, it satisfies the Bray relation, so everybody's happy. At the end of the day, you get just S1, 2, 3. Well, the identity, you just get 1. Okay, so we've seen all this before. Uh, so the only thing I want to sort of insist on, because this will be the main um, purpose of the talk, is, to, is, is the, um, the, 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 the discussion of, of um, descents. So here I've indicated uh, for all these permutations all the, where the descents are, and there's a couple observations you can make already on this simple example. The first one is that, so remember that to each digit you should think there is an associated variable. So the first digit is like x1, x2, x3. So for example, this one has, the last descent is between x, x1 and x2, so to speak, and therefore this polynomial does not depend on x2 or x3. So a, the polynomial, the Schubert polynomial, never depends on variables after the last descent, basically. So in, in this case, it's this one and maybe this one. They, don't, they only depend on x1. So of course, in this example, it's either x1 or x1, x2. So in this case here, because the last descent is uh, um, between 2 and 3, it depends on x1, x2. X1, X2. So observation number one. And the other observation, which is, again, a bit trivial here, but still, uh, whenever you don't have any descents between two consecutive uh, ditches, then this is a symmetric polynomial in the corresponding variables. So for example here, because one and three, there's no descent between position one and position two, it's a symmetric polynomial in x1 and x2. And so, so, so de descents play a crucial role, is all I'm trying to say, in the uh, structure of these polynomials. In fact, let me formalize this more precisely by saying, if we, as usual, define the descent set of a permutation, which is the, the set of integers such that sigma i is greater than sigma i plus one, um, this is a finite set because uh, uh, sigma differs from the identity only in a finite number of spots. And um, then it's pretty obvious from the, from the inductive definition of the Schubert polynomials that, uh, that they are symmetric in variables between two descents. So that's a kind of generalization of what I just said. In, in the variables between two descents, it's symmetric, and then they don't depend on the variables after the last uh, descent. Okay, so far so good. And also, this has also mentioned, been mentioned quite a few times. Uh, there's one special case, which is when uh, sigma has at most one descent. These are Grassmannian permutations, and then, so we can go back to the example. Uh, this would be, um, well, <laughs> really all these cases except uh, the top one. And all, in all these cases, you recognize those polynomials as being, well, here it's a bit trivial, but they're, they're all true polynomials. Um, so, yeah, so, so more specifically, if the descent is uh, at, the would-be descent is at location k, then as sigma is a symmetric polynomial in k variables, a sure polynomial in k variables. And this is a kind of a simple example to keep in mind. Okay, so now what is the problem we're trying to address today? Uh, it's, again, it has already been explained, it's the structure constants. So, so the point is that the, uh, as sigma a former basis of, a, of the ring R of, of a, that, that we just uh, described. So that means we can just do the obvious thing. We t take the product and then we expand. And the only difference is my indices are all inver inverted compared to the usual convention. It's like C pi rho sigma, where pi rho is on top and sigma at the bottom. Don't ask me why I do it this way. It's just, uh, doesn't matter. But yes, yeah, so, so the, the, the whole story is about computing those C pi rho sigma, the structure constants of the, of the offshoot the polynomials. And from geometric considerations, we know that these are actually non-negative integers. So yes, there should be some nice combinatorics. So um, I mean, this morning, Greta tried to dissuade us from solving certain problems in algebraic combinatorics by saying that there is, there is no, no, no simple formula in some cases. We can still hope that for Schubert polynomials, maybe there is some nice combinatorial formula for these. So let's try to do that. Um, all right, so let's see. So, and now let, let me, it, it, mentioned again the, the role of um, descents. So, you know, when you have a polynomial that's symmetric in certain variables, so if you have two polynomials that are both symmetric in, say, exchanging x1 and x2, their product will be also invariant by interchange of x1, x2. So, so these form subrings. So basically, uh, whenever you fix the, the descent set to be constrained to be inside some fixed uh, finite set, then automatically the corresponding linear span of the Schubert polynomials will be a subring. Uh, it's pretty easy to understand. And a strictly equivalent statement is the following. Uh, you, these structure constants, if they're non-zero, 
uh, then sigma cannot stray too far from pi and rho, because its own descent, it cannot have a descent where neither pi or rho had a descent, because that would break the symmetry property. All right, so d of sigma is, is a subset uh, of d of pi union d of rho. So there's the, this, these, these natural subrings in which you could try to ask for a formula for these uh, c, pi, c pi or sigma. And again, the most, uh, the most uh, classical example would be when you ask for the descent to be, well, at most at, at location k, this is the usual um, question of multiplying together sure, sure polynomials. And then the c pi or sigma are nothing but the uh, little original coefficients, which were mentioned many times, and for which there are many uh, combinatorial formula. I'm not going to go through that today. Um, you could also, of course, the next thing you could say is maybe, OK, I'm going to take some other subrings. And we did that in the first paper uh, with Alan. And we did, this is the kind of the original approach we had. But today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We are going to compute the c pi or sigma when we, we put certain restrictions on, on the descents of, of the two Schubert polynomials that we're multiplying, but more complicated constraints than simply saying they have to be inside some given subset. It'll be a little bit trickier. You'll see. OK, so so far, so good. So we've defined the problem. And ah, right. So before I go on and actually tell you how I'm going to try to solve this problem, um, let me talk about all the generalizations we have in mind. So, this is the Schubert polynomials I just defined, and you all know that there's a natural generalization, which is Grothendieck polynomials, which were also mentioned yesterday. So let me say immediately that everything I'm going to say today works equally well for Grothendieck and Schubert. These, for me, are completely kind of equivalent. The, the formalism we use doesn't really care whether you're talking about cohomology or K-theory. It's perfectly happy to handle either of them. So there's essentially no difference. In fact, in the paper, we always do Grothendieck instead of Schubert, but I think, uh, yeah, Grothendieck instead of Schubert, but for pedagogical purposes today, I'll stick to uh, Schubert. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can, oh yeah, and, and, and the arrow here it means uh, that you take the lowest uh, degree part of the Grothendieck to get back to Schubert. So if you can solve the Schubert problem, you can definitely solve the Schubert. If you solve the Grothendieck problem uh, for multiplying them, you can, uh, you can solve the Schubert problem as well. Uh, the other direction of generalization is double Schubert, where you have another um, alphabet, and then the coefficients themselves depend on this alphabet. And again, to, to a large extent, our methods work equally well for a double Schubert or Schubert, with a little caveat that I'll uh, come back to later, but essentially they, they also work. And in fact, obviously, you might as well just generalize together and say that you, know, you have uh, double Grothendieck polynomials, and, and in each case, all these arrows means specialization in some, in some way. So if you can do things for a double Grothendieck, you can do it for all the other ones. Now, these are probably the most natural uh, generalizations from a combinatorial point of view, but actually, for our purposes, we need something else. Uh, so these classes, sorry, these uh, objects here, first, they're no, no longer polynomials, they're rational functions, uh, and they're most natural in a kind of geometric setting. They, they are two uh, Schubert classes. Um, I'm going to say it wrong. The, the, these rational functions are, are to these classes, where Schubert polynomials are to Schubert classes. So they are. Uh, representatives of certain classes living in, in the K-theory or cohomology of, um, of uh, partial flag varieties, and so they have fancy names like motivic Segre classes or Segre uh, schwartz mcpherson classes and their equivalent uh, versions. So we're not really going to talk about that today, but I just want, want to mention that they're there, and we need them at a technical level to uh, do things, and those, so they form this nice little cube of all, uh, all things. And so really all our formulas so I guess the highest level would, would be equivalent motivic segre. So all the formulas work at this level, and then you have to do all kinds of specializations and limits to get back to these. And sometimes these limits are a little bit complicated, and, and that's, you may encounter some difficulties, but at the end of the day, we do get some nice positive combinatorial formulas for Schubert. So that, that's the general pattern. Uh, there's one more direction of generalization, but I ran out of dimensions to uh, describe it, so that's the fourth dimension. You should imagine there's another cube outside that cube for a hypercube or something. Um, so I ran out of space. Anyway, all of these models have kind of what we would call in, 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 in kind of mathematical physics language higher spin versions. And so, for example, typically what you get there is like higher rank versions of spin hole Littlewood functions or whatever they're called. And, and so you have a whole zoo out there expanding out of in, in this direction. In particular, you have whole Littlewood polynomials, for example, which also fit in this general pattern. And we can get in the exact same way uh, product formulas for all of these. Um, now, there are more generalizations you can think of, but the, pro the point is I don't know how to deal with them. And before you ask me, 
what about type C or whatever? Yes, you could also do type C cases or uh, B or D, you could do, but we don't know how to, the tools we use don't obviously work in other types, or for example, they don't obviously work in quantum cohomology if you like such things, or, so there are other, of course, directions of generalization, but the point is that all, for all of these, the same approach works and will give you uh, product roles. So you will be able to compute those structure constants. All right, so now, uh, where, so now I want to explain the other part of the title, which is exactly solvable models. Okay, so my interest, as I said, is applying methods for mathematical physics. So there are two different words which I use interchangeably, exactly solvable models or quantum integral systems. And occasionally I may use one instead of the other. And so I, uh, just, uh, just a word of warning. So th these are basically like, um, yeah, they're, they're, it's, a top, it's a topic in mathematical physics. And I'll try to give you a very, uh, like a, a kind of a crash course in uh, integrable systems in, in the next few slides. And so my interest in, 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 in this, uh, subject was around maybe 10, 15 years ago, I started realizing that many families of polynomials uh, can be expressed naturally as what we would call partition functions of these exactly solvable models. And at, start, I, I, at, the, at, start, at the start, I mostly worked with symmetric polynomials. They're the ones which are probably the most um, uh, natural to appear there. And I was looking at sure polynomials, uh, symmetric Grothendieck polynomials, LLT polynomials, and so on. And it seemed a bit yeah, I was, I was very happy, oh, this works, this is great. We can all write them as partition functions and we can use our, our own tools from my own kind of toolbox from my integrable systems to study them. And then I realized, oh, actually, we don't even need symmetry. You can consider non-symmetric polynomials like Schubert polynomials or general Grothendieck polynomials and they fit in the same, uh, yeah, they, they work as well. And of course, at this stage, I realized, oh, actually, this is not new. Uh, this was already now. And in fact, in the case of Schubert and Grothendieck, which is really, what we care about today. Um, uh, I had basically what I had recreated was something that was already known, which is the, uh, um, you know, the, the work of, that has already been mentioned of uh, Bergeron and Billy. Um, so basically what I guess we now call pipe dreams. Uh, so it's extremely closely related to pipe dreams. It's pipe dreams in disguise with maybe a, a little bit of a, a twist or a different point of view. And in fact, uh, even more specifically, that's this paper by Fomin and Kirillov in which they explain that Secretly, there's a young Baxter. They say there's the young Baxter equation uh, inside Schubert polynomials in, 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 the, in, the, in the form of a pipe dream. So the young Baxter equation is like the trademark of integrable systems. So in a sense, this was already known, and it was just a reinterpretation of known results. But anyway, it was just um, that's the way I, I kind of I got into this. But uh, I should also point out that there's actually, by now we have much more thorough understanding in the last 10 years of what, what is really going on. And there's a lot of deep connections with, um, between all these families of polynomials and rational functions with geometric representation theory. Um, and this was for first, and, and, and various, so, so there's a, by now we have a very clear picture of why these polynomials are sort of partition functions of exactly solvable models. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but there's a lot of sort of very interesting and, and, and pr profound work relating uh, different areas. In particular, I'm thinking of the work of uh, uh, Kunkov and, and, and collaborators and, and re related work by Romani tarasov Varshenko, uh, this whole cotangent Schubert calculus that I'm not really gonna talk about um, today. But so this part of the story uh, by now is very well understood. And again, we're, at the moment, we're not yet even asking the question of computing structure constants. We just, th this is only the first part of the program, we're just trying to look at polynomials themselves and reinterpret them in the world of exactly solvable models. There will be a second step, which will be to compute the structure constants, and we'll get to that. But let's take things slowly. So uh, how about we just, for now, so now I'm gonna explain this, this statement here, that in the case of Schubert, Schubert polynomials, how, what does it mean that the Schubert polynomials can be expressed as a partition function? So the first thing I'm gonna do, this is my own, well, my own, no, it's, it's it's the way I want to encode permutations. I don't actually want to use permutations, I want to use strings. So I'm going to use all the time this little kind of way of encoding permutations. I start with a permutation which, in which I mark the, um, uh, the descents. The next thing you do is you, 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 you choose your favorite totally ordered set. And in, this, in my case, it's always, always going to be the non-negative integers. And you fill uh, the space between the, the descents with uh, an increasing a sequence uh, from your uh, favorite uh, totally order set. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. Um, and finally, what you do is you re reorder uh, these, so, so, these, um, so this I always call omega. This is kind of like 
is, this defines for you sort of the content of your string, and then you use the permutation to put back all these numbers in the spots where they should be. So like this says that this zero should be at location one, this zero should be at location three, this one at location six, and so on. And you get this way a uh, string in, in the uh, alphabet that you chose, uh, which I always denote lambda, so I use this and um, so, so, of course, there are choices to be made. So the one thing, of course, you can do is, because our permutations are really S infinity permutations, you have the freedom to add more um, um, digits here. Like, already this seven is completely uh, useless. You, you, you don't need it, but I'll, you know, you could add an eight here, and then you'd add another two, and so on. So there's some freedom. The, it's not it's one-to-one, not -one, but that's fine. Uh, and the other thing you can do is you can also arbitrarily decide that where there is no descent, I'm going to just add a descent just for fun. So for example, you could add a descent here, and then they would shift all the alphabet. It would be like 0, 0, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and that would be also perfectly fine. It would be a sort of non-minimal choice of, of string, but you know, it might be use, we'll actually use that freedom later, so let's keep this in mind. And if you like, uh, so the, of course the other map is well defined. If, if you have a string, you can definitely um, in a unique way, you, you can recover the permutation. As you can say, you can say that sigma is the inverse of the standardization of lambda. So you take this thing, you standardize it. So I guess you would start from one rather than zero. So it'd be something like one here. There'd be a two. There'd be a three here, and so on. And then you invert the permutation, and you get back to your original one. So everything is fine. Um, so the string contains all the information on the permutation. That's all that matters. All right. So now, what is the um, so, so here's the, the rules of the game. If there's only one thing you get out of this talk, this is probably it. This is, what do I mean by a petition function? It's always the same rules, and they're quite simple. You start from some domain in the plane. Uh, you pave it in some way, in, in terms of elementary polygons. And the rules is you're supposed to put labels on edges. And each, and there'll be some rules, what you're allowed to, which labels you're allowed to put where, and each such picture will have a corresponding weight, which is typically a polynomial or just a number. And, and then you're supposed to sum over all the possibilities of, of labeling that uh, underlying uh, um, um, graph, in some sense, planar graph. And so in our case, the, 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 the graph will always be just the square lattice divided into smaller squares. So it's an n by n square lattice. And now, now comes the golden rule. The boundary edges, you know, the external ones, which I'm pointing now at, they are fixed. You're not allowed to sum over them. You have to decide once and for all what you're going to write on the boundary edges. The internal edges are summed over. They're the ones where you actually have a choice. You have to decide, for, you have to, you're allowed to put anything on the internal edges as long as they satisfy certain constraints, which I'm going to explain now. Okay, so now, now what is the, what is the, um, the, the theorem. So you start with a permutation sigma, you represent it with a string lambda, where, and omega as before is just the, the, sort, of, the sort of lambda, so just the, the digits uh, written in a weakly increasing fashion. And here, here's how the boundaries are going to be. You're going to put the omega on the left boundary, you're going to put lambda on the top boundary, so each edge will have now a number on it, and I'll show you in a second how that looks. And also on these ones, I'm going to add one more letter to my alphabet, which is a blank. And I'm going to put a blank on all of these uh, other spots, east, well, uh, right and uh, bottom uh, edges. And the inside, you can fill in any way according to the following rules. The, 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 the internal, so each elementary square, which I call a plaquette, is, uh, can only be on, of, of one of two forms. Either if you have ii, so the same uh, digit repeated twice, uh, horizontally and vertically, but with a constraint that i is less than j. Or uh, i has to go to i, i here and j, j here. So you fill all, all this, this square with these rules. And finally, what I have to tell you, so you sum over all possibilities, and each such picture will contribute a monomial. And that monomial is obtained by just uh, taking the product over all of these plaquettes of the first kind. Um, so an, an xr for each plaquette of this type on the auth row. So each row has morally a different uh, X attached to it, and that's how you can construct the, um, the Schubert polynomial. Now, if, once I've said all this, you'll be like, oh, we've already seen this. These are pipe dreams. And you're almost right. It's essentially pipe dreams. Oh, and also I should say that when I say I less than J, I'm implicitly ordering uh, so that the blank is, uh, is large, larger than any integer. Um, and yeah, so the first thing I'm going to do next is 
obviously, we don't actually, we're not going to use numbers because that's ugly. So we're going to use uh, lines of color to describe those numbers. So the first thing I'm going to do is replace zero with you know, yellow, whatever. You, you, you pick your favorite colors. And so in principle, you have an infinite number of them. And I'm going to replace the digits with colors to make it look nicer. And so in particular, immediately you, you recognize that these two plaquettes was just a secretly a way of, of drawing these two possibilities. So either a crossing of two lines or two lines avoiding each other. And so let's take an example. If we do it for um, one, three, two, um, the corresponding string got a minimal choice of a string would be zero, one, zero. So you put zero, zero, one here, zero, one, zero here. You try to fill it with those two things and these are the only possibilities you get. And yeah, these are pipe dreams except I've, I've called them for some reason. And, um, and of course, you, so here there's a crossing on the first row, here there's a crossing on the second row, so you get x1 plus x2, you're happy, that was your uh, Schubert polynomial associated to 1, 3, 2, so yeah. So we know the story, I'm not gonna show you the other example. Oh yeah, one quick remark. Uh, you'll notice that it seems very wasteful. I've, I've used a whole square, but really all these pipe dreams live on the upper triangular, on, in, the, in the upper, well, the northwest tri triangle. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of wasted space. So let me just flash really quickly that more generally you can consider things which we call gen generic pipe dreams where, where you don't you relax the constraint on i and j in the crossing and then they can really go anywhere. So we really need, in general, the full uh, square. And, uh, and this is when you're trying to do more general things like compute those Mativic Sager class rational functions. You need more general uh, pipe dreams which, are, which we call gener generic pipe dreams. And if you, if you, if you want to reduce to say Schubert or Grothnik polynomials, you have to take some limit and then you re recover either the ordinary pipe dreams I just showed you, or maybe reduced pipe dreams for Schubert, or the bumpless pipe dreams of, uh, that we were also discussed uh, um, yesterday. Yeah. So, so there's a more general class of pipe dreams which really fill, actually this is not a great example, it barely, sticks out of the uh, triangle. But it can go, and in principle, it can go anywhere, so yeah. All right, so now, now what's, what's the main statement? So far, this is where we're finally gonna say a little bit about exactly sol exact solvability. So this is all about the Young-Baxter equation. So the Young-Baxter equation always takes this form. It's a, lo it's a relation satisfied by sort of the local weights on the small, in a small little hex hexagon of size one. It says the following, so, I've introduced an extra notation here, which is I've marked every um, square, well, okay, these are deformed squares, so now they're rhombi, but whatever, uh, every uh, um, rhombus with an extra marking. So maybe I should have explained that first on the previous slide. Oops, wrong way, wrong way. Um, right, so in the uh, original formula, sorry, this is irrelevant, yes. Uh, in this formula, remember that uh, you have to distinguish which row you're working on, because, oh, that's a stupid example, let's do it. Sorry, having trouble. Here we go. So remember that a crossing contributes a, a variable attached to its row. So morally, each of these plaquettes has an associated variable x1. I just didn't mark it because it looked too ugly. But for the purposes of the Young-Baxter equation, I'm marking it explicitly. This means fill this with either a crossing or uh, elbows and give a weight of x to the crossing. Here is the same, but this time I give a weight of y to the crossing, where x and y are formal variables. And finally, this is the same, so it's either elbows horizontally or crossing, and the weight is x minus one. And the funny thing is, these two sets, these two uh, uh, left sides of the equation are equal, where again, golden rule, that means you've fixed which path are entering or exiting through this little hexagon, and you're allowed to sum over the three internal edges. All right, so it's a non-trivial equality, and it happens to be true, and so be it. Uh, so why is it useful? So again, this is the, the kind of exactly solvable models 101, kind of literally, because I actually teach that uh, regularly. Uh, so the, the way you apply this equality is always the same. So we start from our original partition function, which is this Schubert polynomial for, for this, the, the permutation associated to the string lambda. And we notice the following. Oh yeah, yeah, so by the way, I get lazy, these are supposed to be, they're supposed to be little bars here, these are supposed to be blanks, and I got lazy and didn't actually draw them. So the, the boundary here is actually fixed to be blank, but blank is, temp is tempting to just draw it as literally blank rather than a little bar, so I've, I've become lazy. So you should think of all these as marked as blanks. And now you notice the following. There's no harm in adding one extra rhombus and twisting the picture a little bit, uh, adding the little rhombus here, because if this is blank and blank here, it will also be blank and blank here because that's con continuity of all the, the path. The path cannot, go, cannot emerge out of nowhere. So, so this is actually an equality, a formal equality of partition functions, where again, the, the boundary now is, is blank 
around, with that extra rhombus added. But now you notice that this little picture looks very much like the left-hand side of the Young-Baxter equation, so you can replace it with the right-hand side. And the two variables here, x and y, would be, I guess, x is xi, it's the one attached to this row, and y would be xi plus one. So the parameters are, um, uh, just in this case, yeah, these two, two variables. If, if, in this example, it would be the second row and the third row, so it would be x2 and x3. Um, and then you, you play the game by pushing it all the way to the left. So this is sometimes known as the unzipping argument or the uh, train track argument or whatever. So you just repeatedly apply the Baxter equation until you get to the other side. And then there are two cases, either omega i equals omega i plus one, and you can do the exact same thing. You can just remove it from the, the, the left by saying, well, if there are two paths of the same color, they're forced to basically go horizontally and you can remove it. And what you've shown this way was the, the upshot. You've effectively, you know, the key point here is that x was on the top, y was on the bottom, y is here is on the top, x on the bottom. You've switched the variables xi and xi plus one. So what have you shown this way very easily is that if there are no descents, which is the case, which means omega i equals omega i plus one, you have symmetry under the interchange of the two variables. So that's also kind of why symmetric polynomials are particularly natural in this uh, exactly solvable sort of model story, because the, you immediately get the property of symmetry, symmetry under exchange of variables by using such tricks. Now, if omega i is not equal to omega i plus one, which means you do have a descent, you have to work a little bit harder. I'm not gonna show you today, uh, but you will get, uh, uh, the induction formula for Schubert polynomials. <coughs> yeah. Maybe on the previous slide you should say that the top symbol is not used. Indeed. I am old but not that old. <laughs> All right, so, so now let's talk about the actual uh, problem we're trying to uh, address today, which is the structure constants as an exactly solvable model. So there's been a lot of confusion there. I think a lot of people don't understand this is a separate step. It's different. Reformulating Schubert polynomials as partition functions is something we need, but it's not enough to compute the C, C pi over sigma. So we need another idea there. And so the other idea is to reinterpret Knudsen tau puzzles. Uh, okay, this is the part where I show, if you want to play with Knudsen tau puzzles, Alan has kindly brought us little puzzle pieces. Um, so, so I'm not going to tell you more about Knudsen tau puzzles, but the idea is to reinterpret them as an exactly solvable model. So what are puzzles, for, so we're gonna generalize them, so that's what I call in general Schubert puzzles, and I'm just gonna tell you kind of for now an abstract version of what, what these puzzles should be, and then I'll give you some explicit rules. So the way that it should work is as follows. First, you, you define strings, lambda, mu, nu, which are associated to your three permutations, pi, rho, sigma, and you mark them on the sides of an equilateral triangle. So you should imagine here is lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, lambda n, mu one, mu two, mu n, mu one, mu two, mu n, so you mark the edges according to the three um, permutations, which makes sense. And then you're supposed to fill the inside in, in a certain way uh, with certain rules. Again, so it's, it's a partition function just as before. And uh, the only difference is first, you have triangles rather than rhombi. And the other difference is because we're doing Schubert, uh, uh, single Schubert polynomials, there will be no parameters attached to lines or columns. This will be all a counting problem. So essentially, I'm, what I'm saying is I want to say that C by row six sigma is just the number of puzzles where the boundary is fixed and the inside I have to give you the rules for the inside. So that's, that's how it's going to work. Um, okay, I'm just going to flash. So, so, so the, the main theorem of, of our series of papers is, is indeed that there is a, a sort of general framework in which, in which this works. And I'm just going to flash kind of like a, the, the main theorem, which is kind of the proof of the uh, of the, the main, uh, you, you can see how the different pieces at least combine into, so, okay, so first, what is the formula we're trying to prove? We're trying to prove that uh, if we substitute in this formula C, C lambda mu nu a certain puzzle, um, then this should be equal to S lambda S mu, obviously. That's what we're trying to prove. So let's first use the, start with the left-hand side. Let's reinterpret this as a partition function. And now something nice happens. The, these two pieces kind of nicely concatenate together. This is a puzzle. This is your Schubert lattice model. And because this is an internal edge now, this is automatically sum, summed over. Remember the golden rule. So lambda and mu are fixed, but nu is summed over. So you get for free the summation over nu by just gluing together all these, these two lattice models together. So that's the left-hand side. What about the right-hand side? It looks a bit stupid. It's just S lambda times S mu, but I'm suggestively rotating by 60 degrees the, 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 those two pieces in order to just leave a little bit of room here in the middle. But you know, so these two pieces don't talk to each other, so we want to make them talk to each other. So what do we do? Well. How about we just insert arbitrarily a trivial puzzle here? A puzzle which is completely frozen, which has only one configuration so that it contributes just one. That, will, that's, that is still the same, right? 
And now the, the main theorem of our papers is basically that there is some way, if you define, of course, the, the puzzle lattice model in a, a clever way, there's a, a bunch of moves which are young Baxter like, so a bunch of local transformations of these lattice models in such a way that these two things are equal. So in a sense, you're taking this piece and you're kind of pushing it through the triangle and it now produces two different uh, pieces on the, on the other two sides. So that's kind of like the, 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 main, the main theorem. And so the only thing I have to tell you now is what exactly is the puzzle lattice model. And that will be the rest of the talk, so in the last 15 minutes. OK, so I have three, um, three um, rules I want to show you. Separated descents is the first one. It's the easiest one. And then we'll get to more complicated things. So the easiest rule is the separated descent rule. And it's, it's the following. It's, 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 the picture is worth a thousand words. Here are two permutations. Here are the descents. And the, the, the constraint is that the first descent of pi has to be um, greater or equal to the last descent of uh, rho. So this is a typical picture. Let me give you an example immediately. 2, 4, 5, 7, 6, 3, 1. And I decided to put an 8 on for both of them for reasons that will become clear in a second. Uh, here's another one, 4, 3, 1, 5, 2, 6, 7, 8. So these two permutations satisfy the separated descent uh, property. And now we're going to play the usual game of replacing them with um, strings. And we're going to use a little bit of a weird alphabet. Here, normally, the rule should be 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, or whatever. So I'm going to decide to use different alphabets for the, for the, 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 the top, the, for pi and for rho, and the alphabet will involve blanks again. And I'm going to put blanks all the way to the sort of common descent. And then I'm going to use, OK, maybe I should have started with rho. So rho has 0, 1, 2, 2, and then I only use blanks. And here has all blanks, and then 3, 4, 5, 5. So this is still the, I, I mean, I have the choice of the alphabet, right? And I don't have to have the same one for both. So I'm going to use different alphabets for them. And I should also tell you the alphabet for the bottom one, for sigma. Sigma hasn't appeared yet, but it will be the, at the bottom of the puzzle. You'll have, you'll have some string, and you have to interpret it. And this is very easy. You just take the union of the two, ignoring the blanks. So I think this is, yeah, here we go. So omega 1 encodes pi, omega 2 encodes rho, omega 3 encodes sigma, which hasn't appeared yet, but will very soon. And so if you do the actual game of you know, permuting these sequences according to the permutations, you know, like uh, position 1, you have 5, blank, 4, Blank, blank, three, blank, five somewhere uh, here. And if you do the same thing with a row, you'll get this mu, which is uh, made of two, one, zero, two, and a bunch of blanks. All right. So, so theorem number one. Um, let pi and rho have separated descents. Then here are the rules of the game for the um, puzzles. So you're going to build puzzles which have triangles, uh, except for so just to squeeze more information into a single slide, I've glued together two, two triangles which always come in pairs. So there are only two possibilities, maybe. Either you have path of color. So as usual, I, I represent numbers using colored path. So either you have a crossing of two path uh, in a rhombus, and only when j is greater than i. So the, the left one has to be uh, a greater number than the, the left one. This looks, by the way, very similar to pipe dreams, and I'll have a word to say about that. And or you have path which have, uh, we can just move freely uh, any, way they, any way they like inside triangles. Um, yes, and I should also point out that uh, by now there's, of course, a different rule for uh, separated descents. You, but, and, and, and as far as I understand, there's even a bijection with our rule. Uh, and see this paper for details. OK, so first example of an actual rule. So let's see. Uh, and, and, and that's where you'll see why I've added an extra eight here in our uh, um, permutations. So I've, I've given the, so this is the same example we had. So it's 2, 4, 5, 7, 6, 3, 1, 8 um, times, all oh, right. So if you want, okay, maybe without the descent is fine for now. So these, this is the same example. I'm trying to take the product. So what I do is I, I fix uh, the, the two uh, northwest and northeast sides to be fixed to be those uh, strings that I computed. And then I look at, at, at the bottom and a miracle occurs. You only, you get exactly a single, there's no blank at the bottom. Uh, actually, that's obvious. And, um, and so you, you get a string there. And then you have to decode that string to get back to a permutation. So let's do it on this example. So uh, these are all the puzzles, but I only you know, showed you one in detail. So for example, this one, well, the 0 is at location 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's 5, 6, um, 4, 7, 3, 2, 1, 8. I'm not cheating, but yes, it's correct. It's here. Uh, and so I claim that if you do the same game with all, all of these puzzles, uh, you get all, all, of, uh, all of these permutations. And you'll notice that uh, some of these puzzles, uh, some of these permutations have a seven 
uh, at the last pod. So if you had not in included this eight here, it seems harmless, but then you would miss uh, the ones which do not fit in uh, S7. So in other words, you always have to make the puzzles large enough in such a way that um, all the permutations are, so the puzzle has to has, have size n, uh, such that all the permutations pi or sigma are in Sn. So it, that means occasionally you may have to pad until it kind of stabilizes. But, you know, that's a minor detail. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you have seven terms, so you, here's your Schubert identity. Okay, that's model number one. Um, the second model is almost separated descent. This one is getting a little bit more complicated. Um, we say that pi and rho have almost separated descent when, well, the picture is pretty clear, right? Now you're allowed to have like two in common, basically. So if the, the last two descents of pi occur, occur at or before the first two descents of rho. And I've done real, something really sneaky, by the way. If, if some of you are really observant, you'll notice that I've switched pi and rho in this definition. This is really perverted. Now pi has the, the, the descents to the left and rho the descents to the right. And there's a reason I'm doing that. But uh, it's debatable whether it's a, yeah, anyway. Whether it's a good idea to do so, but I've done it anyway. Um, so here's an example. And, and for fun, I've actually used my freedom. You know, it's not like we actually need all those descents. This is an example, but you can always decide to add arbitrarily non-descents to the descent set. So here I've decided that actually I'm not gonna have a descent here. That's okay, non-descents are always allowed anywhere. So here's pi, it has four, one, three, two, five, six, seven. We're always two, five, four, three, one, six, seven. And sure enough, they satisfy the almost separated descent. I compute, so, and so now the game is almost the same. So, um, so pi will have alphabet starting from zero, zero, one, two, and then blanks. And two is in common. This is the place where you can have descents in both, uh, like the common area of the, of the descent set. So this will have, the, the two will also appear in the alphabet of row. And then I start at continue. So zero, one, two, two. Three, four, four, four. So, you know, the nice thing is that this um, uh, matches. So, in particular, you can imagine what I'm going to do. Oh, no, I spoiled it. I should have asked you before showing it. So, the obvious thing you would do for the alphabet of sigma is just to take 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 4. But that would be too easy. So, actually, we're not going to do that. We're going to decide that the alphabet at the bottom has a blank where there was a 2 uh, before. Don't ask. It's just the way it works. Um, so, and then, as usual, we use this alphabet to encode pi, we use omega 2 to encode rho, and omega 3 uh, to encode sigma. And so in this case, you get, you know, like 1, blank, 2, 0, blank, 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 and then 4, blank, 3, 2, 4, blank, 4, 4. Yeah, you can have as many blanks as you like. Okay. If, if the two, two common descents are kind of very far apart, yeah, you would, you'd have more. Um, all my examples are kind of chosen to be minimal because otherwise things explode. The number of puzzles grows very fast. As... So is two greater than or less than one? <laughs> Good question. So in these alphabets, yeah. So each of these is, a, is its own separate world, right? So each alphabet has its own rule. So these are always in the order in which they, so zero is less than one, is less than blank, is less than three, for the purpose of omega three. They don't talk to each other, they're separate alphabets. But yeah, it can get a little tricky. Okay, so rule number two, um, let pi and rho have almost separated the end, the coefficient of blah, 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 so the same story, number of puzzles, and now we're, we have path, but the path all move eastwards, so they all path kind of migrating from the left side to the right side of the puzzle. And the other property is you can have multiple paths on a given northwest or northeast edge. But they have to be of distinct colors. There, there can be several paths of the same color, but they cannot be in the same spot. So in other words, you can think of the labeling on, the, on these two edges as being made of subsets of whatever uh, integers you had in your, uh, in your strings. So, so the labeling here is in terms of subsets, but at most, one path can deviate from the horizontal. So that means if you look at the horizontal edges, there's a, at most one path going through. Uh, so here's what, how it looks like. So you have a bunch of um, path which, uh, which are, so you have uh, x union y here, you have x here, you have one path that can go across, and then you have again a bunch of uh, lines here which are denoted by y, and here you have y union i, and there's an extra constraint which is i has to be less than all the elements of x, and so only the smallest path can go downwards, and only the largest path can go upwards. So it's, there's a very strong constraint on, um, on what, how path can deviate from the horizontal. And, and, and these are the other two possibilities you can have, uh, but they're correlated. If, 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 you have all, if you have no path going through um, the horizontal edge, then you can only have a, a single 
path both above and below that horizontal edge. Or you can have a completely empty one. So these are very specific roles which, you know, I, I, trust me, these are the correct roles. Anyway, so here's the same example um, in terms of, um, yeah, in, in this almost separated descent rule. So these are the same strings we had. Let's see, one dash two zero dash 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 four blank three two blank four four. And there are, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, again, um, puzzles. Uh, you can see how it can get pretty tricky, right? Some paths can now start to um, kind of um, being glued together. Um, and you read, as usual, the string as before. So in this case, it would be like uh, six, five, uh, no, six, three, five, uh, two, one, four, seven. And sure enough, this is your. Um, and, um, and you have the other ones, you trust me, it, you give, give this result. And by the way, all of these are actually checked by computer by computing all these triple polynomials and checking that these identities are correct in case there was any doubt. Uh, before I give you the final rule, one quick word. So I'm, there's a lot of underlying representations here, which is how we actually build those puzzles. And the, the idea is that you, you, that you build solutions of the young baxter equation and from there an exactly some of the model out of the representation theory of certain objects called Yangians. And um, so, so that there are, in other words, there are rich systems hidden behind this story. In particular, the, the pipe dream model is based on the Yang of, of type A, so SL D plus one, where D is just the number of descents. Uh, and so, in other words, you can reformulate the search for Schubert puzzles as finding a bigger Yang that contains the original Yang defining your polynomials as a subalgebra and some, with some very complicated constraints uh, com coming from the geometry of rich systems. So, so it's all the search about, of basically the right the algebra, ultimately. So for example, the separated descent model is also based on the Youngian of A n, where n is the sum of the number of descents of both permutations. So n is greater than d. So you're embedding basically a Youngian of A d inside a Youngian of A n, where n is greater than d. So it's a bit boring. And that's why the rule is a bit boring. That's why these puzzles basically look themselves like pipe dreams, because it's essentially the same model in disguise. Uh, the almost separated descent model is based on the Youngian of d n, so SO2n which is already more interesting. That's why you're, you're getting a very different structure. Um, and you may see where I'm going with this, which is that, uh, so for technical reasons, we so far rest we restrict the search to simply less Lie algebras, and we have a problem here. We kind of ran out of uh, simply less Lie algebras. These are the only two infinite series. And you can see that the, 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 the rank of the algebra uh, kind of controls the number of descents. So if you want to have rules which contain an arbitrary number of descents, well, that's all there is for now, at least for us simply less the algebras. The only thing left is, well, exceptional the algebras. So how about in the last three minutes, I give you a model based on E6. Uh, we also tried with E7 and E8 with the varying levels of success, but E6 works really great, so how about I do that? So this is, by the way, in published work. Um, so let uh, pi and rho in, in S infinity, so now we cannot allow the number of descents to grow arbitrarily. So it, it, they only have to have it at most let's say, uh, three descents, each of them. But we will allow a bit of flexibility. So we're not actually going to, you know, you could say, well, how about they just both have the same descent, descent set? So no, no, that would be too restrictive. How about we allow uh, them to have um, different descents, but the middle one should be common. Don't ask why, it's, that's the way it works. So they have it's the same common middle descent, and then the other ones can be wherever you like. And uh, so there's, there are various choices. So I'm, I'm giving you a rule for one choice where the, the descent of pi is to the left of the, the, the left mode descent of pi is left of the left mode descent of rho, and so on. So this is the case I'm going to consider in what follows. So here's an example. 2, 1, 5, 4, 3, 6, 7, 4, 5, 3, 2, 6, 7. Um, this time, for now, I'm just going to use the normal uh, labeling here, just to show you that it doesn't work, because immediately you have a problem. If you use the standard, standard alphabet, in the middle, it gets really messy, right? The numbers don't match anymore, and that's a really bad sign. So we're going to do something different. How about we use path again? So here's the rule. The middle one, we're going to use our favorite uh, colored path. And now there are exactly six colors, not more, not less. And we also allowed unoriented path of two colors, which I use little, draw using these little blobs. And now here's the rule. The, 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 the alphabet for sigma will be using this path. But the alphabet for pi and rho will be using this funny dictionary. And I, unfortunately, I'm only, I have only one minute, so I don't have time to explain how the rule works. It's a very tricky combinatorics, but believe me, this is the right way to encode all these uh, different uh, 
So the story is the same, right? We encode omega 1 using pi, omega 2 using rho, so you get these, these strings, which are a mixture of oriented path. The orientation now is important. All the other paths were secretly oriented, but since they were always going in the same direction, you didn't need to write it explicitly. These paths need to be oriented because they can go in any direction. So here's lambda, here's mu, and omega 3 will be used for, to read the bottom of the puzzles. And so here's the final rule. Um, I'll just show you the pictures, basically. There are, only, there are only two types of triangles you're allowed to have. Either you have a path which changes color, it has to change color, and then it, it emits, it, it kind of, you know, it's like, like uh, quarks emitting bosons or something. You know, it, it, it goes through a triangle and it, it, it produces a little bunch of blobs of two colors. Or you have a, like a, a rainbow uh, triangle where you have all the colors of the, well, the six colors of my rain, limited rainbow. So, all the, so you have to have all the colors together in a triangle, and you can, you can turn these in any ways you like. Uh, and yeah, as I said, all the colors must be present. So that will be my final rule. So here's an example. This, this is the same example we had, 2143674532617. I've encoded it this way, and there are this, type, this time nine diagrams, and the bottom miraculously turned out to be made entirely of uh, digits. There are no funny blobs uh, sticking out. And so you can read it off, you know, six, seven, uh, three, uh, two, whatever, four, one, five. And the other ones are barely visible, but you can trust me that you get exactly this identity. And I think I ran out of time, so thank you. Do we have a question for Paul? Yes? Uh, I saw the one in the front. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, if you wanted to just do the three-step, how does this simplify? Um, yeah, yeah. So, of course, as a special case, you have the, the usual. Oh, sorry. The, the question is, how does this simplify if you consider usual three-step puzzles? Yeah. These, are, of course. Yeah. As a special case, you, you, you don't, they don't have to be different. So. Yeah, it, there would be no particular simplification. This, you can think of this as a generalized three-step rule. Um, I guess the difference would be that then you don't need to do this funny relabeling. Um, you could just use ordinary zeros, ones, and twos, and threes, and it would look just fine. But uh, the, the reason I, I represent it this way is really because that, it, that, that labeling really makes no sense once the, the descents don't match anymore. But, but suddenly, as a special case, you do have the, the three-step rule that we gave in our first paper, yes. Do we have other question? Yes. yes. No, I just cherry picked the. the question? Oh, sorry, the, the question is whether in all my examples it's mul the uh, it's multiplicity free the, the product. I, I cherry picked the examples so that they will look nice and they, you know. If, if, and they would fit on the slide. You know, there's a lot of constraints which effectively force them to be multiplicity free, but there's no reason. Other question? Yes. Right. Can you repeat, Paul? Can you repeat? All right, so, oh, so wrong way, wrong way. You're not supposed to see this. Uh, so, so the question was, was, so was, I guess, actually, what is the question? What, what is the problem with what? Yeah, I just, what's the, uh, if you wanted to extend this approach uh, to, to give, like, the, say, the full Schubert-Schubert structure constant right. problem, uh, why is that not happening? Yeah, so suddenly that's what we tried in the first paper. We, we, had, we, we had this kind of way of, we, originally we had kind of sort of, so here I've, I've presented as a bit of a guesswork. You, you start with, with, you know, the, you have the known model for producing Schubert polynomials, but then you're, you're supposed to guess what the model for Schubert puzzles is. And in the first paper we tried a more constructive approach and we, we, we constructed this new Yangon in terms of the original one. And it turned out that it gave us this sequence, A2, D4, E6, E8, for one step, two step, three step, four steps. And, and then it went crazy, because for five, five step already, it was not, no longer the root system of a simple, simple Lie algebra. So, and that's why we kind of were looking for a sort of an alternative way by, you know, uh, so that, that's why in the third paper, we kind of approached the problem a little bit differently. But, I mean, you can, 
the, so the answer from the original paper would be, well, you, yeah, that if you go, go beyond four step, it's hopeless, because in principle, there should be a formula, but based on the Yang and of some uh, complicated Katsumudi algebra, and God knows what the representation theory of, of such a beast would be, because, you know. Um, from, and from this point of view, as I said, we just ran out of um, um, simple, simply laced the algebras, and well, you can try with non simply laced, you can try also with twisted, I find the algebra, twisted Jungians or twisted, I find the algebras, you can use super the algebras. There, there's, there's probably still a world out there to explore, but uh, within this framework, I think we kind of exhausted the, the possibilities. Uh, so then getting back to Greta Panova's point about computability, um, ha has this given you any insight into, is, is it like fundamentally harder for a higher step or? I, I, well, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but suddenly the, the, the naive answer seems to be that yes, there will be puzzle, you know, puzzles for higher ranks, so to speak, so for a higher number of steps of your, your flag variety or higher number of descents, but it will involve infinite number of pieces and, and the rule might not even be positive. And so, in a sense, yes, there seems to be, but I agree that maybe we should try to make this more quantitative, you know, like suddenly all these puzzles, you know, you can, you can enumerate them in, 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 a, in, in exponential time in the size, size of the system, so they're, they're nice, they're under control, but of course, as soon as you have like infinite numbers of pieces, who knows, uh, that does seem to be like, you, you could, one should probably make a more precise quantitative statement that, that that should be such a statement, that the complexity grows horrendously as the number of uh, descents increases. Thank you. Thank you again to Paul.